The Spin-Off Podcast Network. Is it mad that the world burning is not in our, like, top three concerns? You thought bad news was done, but I'm back with more. In Alice Sneddon's Bad News Saves the World, I finally address the climate crisis and explore why no one cares. Watch it on thespinoff.co.nz. I can see the anxiety (laughs) starting to emit from you. When the Facts Change is brought to you by the Spinoff Podcast Network in partnership with Kiwi Bank. The bank for Kiwi looking to get ahead in business and in life. A bank that delivers expertise and banking know-how, smart advice for business owners wanting to invest, grow their business or diversify. A bank that adapts with technology through the lens of its people and customers. It is a bank with heart that is driven by its purpose. Kiwi making Kiwi better off. If you're listening to this and you're inside a building, have a look around. Have a look at the walls, the windows, the lights and ask yourself the question, what is this building's carbon footprint? It's not something we're used to doing, but increasingly building owners and building builders are having to do that. What is this building's carbon footprint? How much is it going to cost to run, if you like, in terms of carbon emissions? Is it carbon neutral? Does it adhere to some of the carbon emission standards, the Green Star ratings, for example? Will the building be able to be owned by a pension fund in years to come because it's carbon compliant? But not only carbon compliant, but also reducing its carbon emissions and maybe even being carbon negative so that you can appeal to new customers, maybe even staff, to say, come and work in our carbon neutral building. This week on When the Facts Change, we talked to Paul Jurasevich, who is the carbon sector lead for Jazzmax, which is one of New Zealand's biggest architectural and urban design companies. They have a couple of hundred people around the country who talk to large companies, big organisations, universities, councils, these sorts of things, to advise them on what they need to do to ensure their buildings are not only carbon compliant, but also, over the life of the building, potentially carbon negative. And it's a really interesting deep dive into what a building actually does and how it is made and how much carbon is emitted, not just in the running of the building. We forget that all of that concrete and steel that's in a building actually went through a process which emitted huge amounts of carbon, not just the construction of the concrete, remember that has to go through a kiln, but also the actual construction of the building. One of the revelations in this discussion with Paul is that sometimes it's actually much better to not build a new building, to actually refurbish an existing structure. Completely gut it, Take all the panelling off so you've got that core structure and you don't have to put new concrete and steel in, but you can reclad it in a way that means it's much friendlier to live in or to work in, it doesn't need so much energy to heat or to cool down, and that over the life of the building, it could be carbon negative. That's this week on When the Facts Change. What is your footprint And what is the life cycle emissions of the buildings that we live in? Well, kia ora and welcome to Paul Urasevich, who is the Carbon Research Lead at Jazzmax, which is one of New Zealand's biggest and broadest group of building and architecture services companies that helps big companies design places to live and work. Paul, great to have you here in in the spin-off studios for When the Facts Change. Yeah, kia ora. Uh, Thank you for having me. I'm curious about buildings and carbon. We hear a lot about um, transport and farming, but the places we live in and where we work are actually sometimes producing a lot of carbon if we have to heat them or cool them. And also they can produce a lot of carbon when they're built. Could you give us an example of 
let's say it's a building for students and uh, for lectures. Uh, let's say it's a university building. How would you think about designing that building, um, building it? How would you do it to make sure that it was carbon zero, carbon neutral, really helped reduce our emissions? Yeah, um, oh, look, oh, kind of ironically, we would actually first ask if they actually need a new building. Yeah, because we forget that often you you think, oh, we have to bowl that and then we have to put up something new. But putting up something new with a lot of concrete and steel, that can produce a lot of carbon, can't it? Yeah, look, in the past, old buildings would simply be demolished, um, you know, to make way for new buildings. Uh, that thinking has changed really probably in in the last five to ten years, especially, kind of, if you imagine, you know, you've got an existing building. Most of its carbon has already been emitted, um, you know, through the original construction and then its operation. So, um, by reusing that building, um, that then limits the need for new construction, and that new construction would have, you know, it would emit more carbon, um, and so it typically results in a lower carbon project. Um, and I think, you know, organisations are also kind of adopting more sustainable principles in the operation, um, which is driving, you know, that decision-making. I think, like, for universities, um, they probably now focus more on net zero carbon or meeting, you know, UN sustainable development goals, you know, to attract students. Uh, you might have a government organisation, and they're probably driven more by, say, carbon-neutral government programme and green boarding rating tools. Um, alternatively, um, a commercial client might be chasing green funding, you know, where they can actually get cheaper finance for doing green projects. And that's really interesting, isn't it? When you're thinking about building a building, in the old days it was, you know, how much will it cost to run, how much will it cost to build, will it be a nice place for our staff and our students or our customers? But now you also have to think how much carbon is going to be emitted as I build it and then how I run it. Now, let's say, for example, you recondition um, an existing building, a structure that's already there. How much can you save by doing that instead of, um, you know, actually levelling it and putting in foundations and putting up new concrete and steel structures if that's how you're going to build it? Oh, I mean, you know, there's, there's huge savings and, um, and additional you know, benefits. Um, I think... But Jazzmix has got a great example we're currently building for the University of Auckland on Simon Street. So if you drive up there, you can see this construction taking place. It's a large building. Um, and if you think about university campuses, um, you kind of think of, you know, especially the university, Auckland University campus, there's these kind of large, brutalist concrete buildings. And they all have a huge amount of embodied carbon um, locked in, especially in their concrete and steel. Um, so, you know, we Jazzmix and Becker, we were asked to kind of squeeze in more staff into that existing B201 Sciences block. Uh, so we did a review, an asset review, and that showed that you know that, that existing building, you know, when you get into the deep, you know, the depth of the review, you know, the facade, the interior, and the services were all effectively at the end of life. Um, we then um, reviewed various development options, and it became clear that you know adaptive reuse, adaptive reuse of the existing building made the most sense, both financially and also from a carbon perspective. And it would allow you to change the way the buildings operate for the future as well. Because when it was built originally, which might be, you know, 40 or 50 years ago, uh, back then, no one really thought too much. <laughs> Electricity was cheap back, back then. And you could um, heat it or cool it however you want. So this gives you a chance to sort of reconfigure it so that the operation of it is going to be much less carbon heavy. Exactly, to make it more efficient. So, um yeah, you know, in this case, there, you know, there, there were numerous advantages, um, and kind of yeah. You know, once we did that, that assessment, where it was clear that you know um, adaptive reuse was the smart thing to do, um, the kind of final design was a you know result of that kind of investigation, and um, you know. So you think of this existing building, and then what we did was we um, yeah, we removed some of that existing um, heavyweight concrete facade and replaced it with a more lightweight, more efficient cladding system. And um, that solves seismic issues. You know, you take mass away from a building, that takes away the loads, and so you no longer need to do a seismic upgrade. And that effectively extended the building life by 50 years. Um, and then, I suppose, you know, reusing that structure also saved about 10 to 20% of cost, um, and it reduced the construction program by about 30%, which is about a year, which is a massive saving. So, you know, that has numerous advantages. Um, you know, less, less disruption for staff, for students, um, reduced time to market. So, um, you know, for commercial projects, especially, you know, if you want to limit that risk of being on site when markets can shift, 
wars can start, uh, epidemics can occur, all those kind of things. Or um, if in Wellington, there might be an earthquake. Well, exactly, exactly. And, yes. and also, by not removing the building, that means you don't have hundreds and hundreds of truckloads of stuff going to the landfill, which surprised me when I heard that actually it's the construction industry that produces a lot of the material that goes into landfills. Yeah, it is the major. You know, if you, you look at any landfill and kind of construction materials is the predominant kind of volume that's in there, so we're trying to reduce that considerably, which that adaptive free use does. And when you look at uh, the whole issue of, of a building from an institution point of view, you've pointed out that often you can get better finance if you've got, um, a, let's say, a six-star Green Star rated building and you can say to the funder uh, or the customers – be it the students or the people that you work with, because often in, in the future, if you're a big organisation, you're going to have your customers come to you and say, right, before we buy from you, we want to check to see what your carbon footprint is. And if you've got those numbers and you've built the building to be, for example, carbon neutral to operate or even better, uh, carbon neutral over the life cycle of the building, that gives you a much better uh, opportunity to... Um, Stay in business, basically. I'm curious, too, about the concrete and steel. We don't often think about this, but can you give us an idea of how someone could reduce the lifetime carbon footprint of a building um, but still have concrete and steel or still have a, a reasonably big building that's you know not going to fall over in an earthquake? Uh, if we go into that idea of adaptive reuse, so we're already reusing that steel or that concrete that's in that project. So that that construction has already emitted those emissions. They're already in the atmosphere, in the carbon sink that's out there. They've already had the impact on climate. Um, so in a way, that's kind of neutralised that. So that makes more sense to start with there. Um, at the same time, there's a huge amount of development that's going into steel and concrete and reducing the emissions there. Um, I think... Um, yeah, as far as concrete and steel goes, you know, globally they account for about 15% of all emissions. So just the manufacture of concrete and steel, um, you know, around 15% of all emissions on the planet. Just backing up for those people who you know, don't know how concrete and steel is made and why it would um, produce emissions, just, just go through the, the sort of science, if you like, of carbon emissions for concrete and steel. Uh, well, I'll try and keep it simple as well. Sure. Yeah, no, so, um, if we think of concrete, um, most of that carbon is coming from the production of the Portland cement component, which might only be about 10% of the content, but might be 80% of the overall carbon for the product, you know, for the finished product. Because um, that has to go into a kiln, doesn't it? It, it does. And so, and there's CO2 um, emitted in there, and also that has to be done at a very high temperature. So there's the fuel that goes towards, um, you know, uh, superheating um, that mix to create those chemical processes. Um, I think in New Zealand there's companies like Firth who do concrete. Um, they've made reasonable advances in how they make concrete. Um, they've got an eco-mix range which can reduce carbon intensity kind of about by 20 or 40 percent. Um, and that's effectively through making improvements in that manufacturing process and also just reducing the amount of Portland cement. Um, Unfortunately, that's you know that's that's a product that you have to select and you pay a premium of say ten percent to get that. Um, I think it's overseas where these really exciting um, product materials and, and kind of innovations are happening. I think um, there are several companies already trialling um, alternative cement mixes um, which use um, carbon for curing, so they're actually using carbon infused into the concrete to help ah, make it cure. So it becomes that, a carbon sink Well, it does, it does, it does. I mean, so, I mean, um, so you're locking in carbon, break, well, CO2, it breaks down to carbon, and it's a locked in for effectively the life of whatever that concrete is. So in a way, that concrete becomes a carbon sink, as does the forest. Obviously, it's, it's a manufactured carbon sink, but it is a carbon sink. And so there's manufacturers overseas that are now producing that and effectively creating you know, virtually zero carbon concrete. There's issues around, there's still technical issues which are coming around, but um, there's a range of manufacturers who are actually producing close to zero carbon concrete um, overseas, and steel has got similar kind of innovations. When the Facts Change is brought to you in partnership with KiwiBank to help you understand the issues affecting the economy. And that's what their team of experts is here to do too. Here's KiwiBank economist Sabrina Delgado on what's happening with the labour market in Aotearoa. Our slowing economy gives way to higher unemployment, and we're seeing tightness in the labour market quickly abating. Both a recovery on the supply side, with our surging migration, boosting labour supply and loosening some very tight labour market conditions. But now a stronger narrative is coming through. As consumer demand cools, so too is the demand for labour. 
Firms are no longer hiring with the same gusto. Already, unemployment has started to lift from record lows, and we expect that to continue throughout 2024. Visit kiwibank.co.nz to stay up to date with detailed economic analysis and forecasts from Sabrina and other KiwiBank experts. They take big issues from both here and overseas and make them relevant to Kiwi businesses. Are you making the most of your KiwiSaver investment? Generate is an award-winning KiwiSaver provider with a track record of strong long-term performance. Making a smart decision now could add tens of thousands of dollars by the time you reach retirement. Book a no-obligation chat with a Generate KiwiSaver advisor today at generatekiwisaver.co.nz slash advice. A copy of the product disclosure statement is available at generatekiwisaver.co.nz. The issuer of the scheme is Generate Investment Management Limited and of course past performance does not guarantee future returns. Ready to rediscover the joys of cycling? With over 300 kilometres of cycle paths across Tamaki Makoto, jumping on your bike and going for a ride is such a fun way to discover the city from a different perspective. Cycling is getting more and more popular across Auckland, so now's a great time to join the hype and give cycling a go. Head to at.govt forward slash cycling to find your nearest cycleway today. It's amazing to think that you could have zero carbon concrete and steel, but there are other ways to build quite substantial buildings, cross-laminated timber. What's the options there if, if you wanted to not just uh, avoid any emissions with the concrete and the steel, but also effectively um, help embed some carbon by you know, keeping that wood uh, you know, in, in wooden state as opposed to burning it or, or letting it emit? Yeah, that, that's kind of the growing trend. I mean, you know, concrete and steel has traditionally been used. Um, that process at CRT where effectively you get timber and you kind of you know, compress it and glue it together um, in an alternative kind of mix, so you're kind of enhancing the strength of the natural material. Um, that is pretty much, you know, in a way it's a, it's a great natural solution to have really low carbon buildings. Um, some of the issues in the past have been around fire, um, but I, I think, Councils and the like, with research understanding that you know there's a charring process that takes place. In a way, it works better than steel in a fire, which might just collapse. Um, and acoustics, and then so you know, it's how you can actually bring that material into a project to still express it and expose it. You know, and you get the kind of natural feel, so it feels a lot you know greater in the project. So it's definitely the big mover. There's restrictions on height in New Zealand, and also some of the durability things, which kind of are being addressed slowly. So I think that's going to be the big mover in the next probably you know five or ten years. And I suspect a lot of the developments in steel and concrete will come on board nationally probably next decade. So um, you know, in decades' time, we've already got the timber technology, and then we're going to get concrete and steel, which is also close to carbon neutral. And when you think about a building and sort of think about its budgets, not just to build it, but to run it, what are the sorts of uh, things you have to plug into your spreadsheet to come out with a carbon footprint number in terms of, uh, you know, the heating costs, the cooling costs, or even, you know, the the commuting or the parking or the other costs that are associated with a building? Uh, the big move there has been kind of, you know, life cycle carbon emissions assessment. Um, if you go back, I suppose, um, in the past, the focus was very much just on energy efficiency, and that was around, you know, energy efficiency standards. Um, as climate change has become more kind of recognised, um, that's developed the concept of operational carbon, which, you know, most people probably will have heard by now. Um, and that's kind of taking account of the greenhouse emissions from that energy to operate that building. So you're taking account of the actual impact of climate as opposed to just looking at the um, the energy. Um, and then you start getting these terms of, you know, carbon neutral, which is referring to, um, you know, those emissions equaling zero, you know, usually over a period of a year, for an example. Um, and the term net zero, you probably heard about as well. So that kind of, that's allowing for an offsetting. So if you don't reach zero emissions, then you pay to get offset credits, which might be through forestry. Um, Obviously, that supply of offsetting credits is already limited and is going to become more limited as people go to that. So we're, ultimately, we're aiming for absolute zero um, in our design. Um, but that operational carbon is kind of only the half story for buildings um, and, you know, and other objects. So there is also the kind of embodied carbon which comes from the materials, the construction, the maintenance and the eventual demolition. So I think if you think probably of a conventional car, um, 
the operational carbon would come from the petrol use. So it's to operate it, use petrol, that emits carbon. Um, and then the embodied carbon is the emissions that occur during its manufacture, maintenance, and hopefully the reuse and recycling at the end of that life. We often forget about that, don't we? Because um, that, that when we think about carbon emissions, it's always, well, give me the... Give me the fancy Tesla. I'll just get rid of my other car, and uh, you know the, the electricity won't cost much at all. But actually, the building of the Tesla yeah. is not easy. And then there's the batteries as well. So this issue of how much work and change you do at the start of the process: do you bowl the building and build something new, or do you refurbish? Becomes more, much more important as you think about embodied mm-hmm. carbon. And that's when you use that life cycle assessment project. So it's true, I mean, that, that example of the car, the Tesla, I mean, I'm not sure where they sit on their embodied carbon, but, um, you know, going back to steel, um, they are now manufacturing zero carbon steel, um, which uses hydrogen in its manufacture. And I know that there's a Swedish company that has delivered that already last year to Volvo, and Volvo is looking to put that into a range, I don't know if it's the full range, but a range of zero carbon steel cars. Um, and Mercedes is also looking into that. So, that, you know, that's a technology that's evolving. And it's only when you look at the overall life cycle assessment that you kind of appreciate the true impact from those projects. And also, not just the building itself and how the building itself operates, but how people use the building. For example, one of the fascinating things for me in the last four or five years in Auckland with a lot of medium density housing is that they're often now built without car parks. So when you do a building, you sort of have to think, am I encouraging car use by having, you know, a big honking car park building underneath? Or am I encouraging people cycling and, you know, having showers or whatever it is? How do you sort of think about that? Do you have any examples of how a building could be uh, constructed or refurbished in a way that actually reduces some of the use or, or carbon emissions by the people who are using it? Uh, I think if we just go back to that university, for example, the B201, um, we did our assessment and then, um, you know, to adaptively reuse it, where we started to, you know, we, we took off the heavy the heavyweight facade, we then, um, in its place, put in a lightweight, thermally efficient facade, and so that had numerous benefits. Um, you know, we've got daylight coming in, so because you're controlling that daylight, you can reduce your lighting loads, which reduces carbon. Um, that efficient facade is also improving the thermal characteristics and the thermal loads that are coming in through that facade. So that is reducing thermal loads in the in the building, and then at the same time, we can have more efficient space conditioning. So we might have chill. We've, well, in this case, we have got chill beams, which is equally more efficient than your conventional air conditioning, you know, heat or cool a lot of air and pump it around. Um, and so we've got that super efficient facade. So when you take account of, you know, reusing the structure, putting on the efficient, you know, um, facade, and then you've got all those advantages of, you know, reducing time on site, um, you know, you're resulting in a project which is, I think, our carbon emissions are around 50% lower than what they would be otherwise. Um, and I think when that project's built, it's probably going to, what's estimated to achieve the highest point six star rating of any project in New Zealand. So again, it's adaptive for reuse, um, making it super efficient, you know, using what you've already got, so you're really taking advantage of that embodied carbon. And and also I'm guessing that if you have a, a building which is more passive, it doesn't have um, big honking air conditioners and uh, heaters whirring and pumping away, it's a more pleasant place to be if you can use your um, windows to, for example, cool things down in summer or close them in winter. If you're working in this place, I know I've been in some brutal <laughs> buildings overseas where, you know, the, the, the machines are whirring the whole time. You've got this air blasting down the back of your neck or uh, you're stuck next to the uh, radiator um, sweating in the middle of winter. It must help too in terms of the um, reducing churn, improving uh, uh, employee satisfaction, that sort of thing. Yeah, I think that is the ultimate, you know, where you can have natural ventilation, where you can have um, the users controlling the environment. And it's not always possible, and so you might do a mixed-mode approach where you have natural ventilation when the exterior suits and when the occupancy is low, or and then you can kind of trim that with mechanical, you know, super efficient mechanical systems. But I think the, definitely the move is to more kind of you know passive systems, natural ventilation, more comfortable, more control, um, you know, the, the more productive spaces. And that's kind of thinking that we're kind of 
shifting also to healthcare and other projects. So it's not just it didn't just start with residential and commercial, and um, it's a move where we kind of transpose it on all of our projects. And also, you know, there's a move to biophilic design where it's taking more natural, you know, natural materials internally, views out and all those kind of things, which, you know, throughout evolution, we've thrived on. And so kind of bringing that back to buildings to make them kind of less artificial. Yeah. You must see a lot of examples overseas of really interesting things. Um, as, as, a, as a researcher and uh, a follower of these uh, new technologies, new ways of doing things, What's really got you excited about um, carbon zero or maybe even um, carbon negative buildings? Uh, oh, look, there's some great projects overseas. Um, you know, like in Denmark, for example, you know, they put an artificial ski field on top of a waste-to-energy power plant. You know, it's kind, of, it's kind of that lateral thinking, which is kind of engaging the people and kind of having multiple uses. How does that work? An artificial ski field on top of a... Yeah, so it's just, there's a massive, you know, it's a large industrial building, it's got a big slope, and they've, they've shaped it so you can make it a ski field, so they've got, you know, a ski field in, in the snow during winter and also in the summer. So it's activating it, bringing people, and it's also one of the cleanest burning pa- you know, power stations around. So it's doing all those things. So, I mean, that's an example of, you know, quite an extreme example of kind of a, you know, a very um, kind of innovative approach to, you know, green design. Um, and as I mentioned, we're on those kind of the verge of, you know, on the verge of some great advances in green tech and carbon neutral materials. You know, we mentioned, you know, the concrete and steel, which could act as a carbon sink in the future, you know, just like a forest. Um, I think, but the, in reality, to make the kind of global reductions required, everything needs to be reconsidered. You know, it's not just these fancy projects which have got tech applied to them and the big budgets, big, you know, big corporate clients and things like that. Um, and as you mentioned, how we live, city design, transport, buildings, everything it needs to be kind of reassessed and evolved to kind of you know meet new demands. Um, you know, there's there's no silver bullet. Um, a mix of strategies is required. Um, is required and is also probably the best approach. So I think everybody, you know, we know that we've all got different goals, um, and the projects that we have, um, they all have limitations, but at the same time, there's awesome opportunities. Particularly in cities, um, your, your point about uh, reconfiguring a building which may have been an office building at one point, becomes a series of lecture theatres. And also I'm fascinated by the idea of some of these big buildings, which were originally designed to be, you know, open floor plan offices, um, you know, one toilet for 100 people or whatever it is, but then be converted into residential or some sort of... um, Different use. Is that where we could actually, you know, um, collectively not only uh, uh, reuse a building, but actually change the pattern of the people who work in the building or who live in the building? They're not having to commute for an hour each day from outer suburbs. I think, yeah, how we reconfigure inner cities is a major component of how we can you know, succeed moving forward. I think you know, there's a statistic, I think by 2060, we're going to double the amount of built area primarily in cities. Um, and that's the equivalent of adding a whole New York City of development every single month. Or it might even be week, actually, but it's that kind of level yeah. of development. And so, yes, that's how we kind of can best manage that and make use of what we've got. Because as we said you know, previously with those those kind of adaptive reuses, you've already used up all that carbon. That's already, you know, we're paying the price for what those impacts are. So we need to really th- rethink how we reuse those and kind of get a mixed, kind of a mixed approach to living. And that kind of, it also brings people together. It kind of activates activity in life. And so it's, 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 I think it's a better overall solution rather than segregating work. And so, you know, you've got your city where it closes at five o'clock and it becomes dead. And then you, you've got your suburbs and you have to drive your, you know, your distance in your car. It's about bringing all of that together. And that's where, you know, these big, the big, you know, some of the cities overseas are really successful. And just um, to sort of wheel back to look at this, uh, the the business case, if you like, for these sorts of projects, we know that it's easier to get funding for um, a, a much more uh, energy efficient but also low footprint building. It's easier to get customers, uh, staff, if they can see it's a nice place to be and clearly it's a five or six or how, however many stars uh, rated building. But from a you know, purely um, capitalist or budgetary point of view, how would a decision maker think about this issue? You know, 
because often the the way that these um, projects are framed, if it's a green building, that means it's just much more expensive. <laughs> but I wonder if you are taking into account the carbon liabilities that you uh, are stuck with 10, 20 years down the line with a building that isn't carbon zero and, you know, lower churn rates for staff, uh, lower operational costs, particularly if the cost of, um, you know, firing up the boiler or whatever goes up over time. Is it easier, is it possible to make a purely financial case for these sorts of buildings? Yeah, I think, yeah, original thinking was just around costs and that was it. And a lot of that, you know, um, QS as engineers, there's a lot of rule of thumb and kind of what's traditional, what they know. And whenever something was a little bit kind of outside the norm, then they would price that in because there's uncertainty with it. And those once kind of those technologies and that thinking becomes more commonplace, like timber construction, where you actually know what is the cost, cost from real projects, what are the advantages, then you'll get a better understanding of true costs. And then when you start factoring, you know, adaptive reuse, where you're not having to, you know, spend all that additional time on site, you know, like, you know, that, that university project, B201, which Jasmine said, we, we don't have a crane on site for a whole extra year. You know, that, those big cranes cost an absolute fortune, and there's also the safety concerns. So, I mean, it's kind of getting real costing involved, and I think the re, also the reality is we're going to have to start paying for carbon. It's been voluntary to date, um, but, you know, the only way to really to effectively meet our requirements, um, our Paris Agreement requirements internationally, is to have a unified global cost of carbon, and that is going to come you know, organisations have foreseen that, corporate clients, you know, through the SG reporting, super funds, you know, there's a, there's a big kind of, there's going to be an increasing demand for green projects and that needs to be factored in because, I mean, if you're not preparing for that, you know, you're going to get hit when energy costs increase, when you can't sell your project because it's not green and those kind of things. So it's becoming a more effective true cost then and that's kind of, it is starting to turn and that's, and that's kind of the big kind of development we've seen where people are getting upskilled and they're understanding better. Paul Jurasevich, who is the um, Carbon uh, Research Lead at Jazmax here in Auckland. Thank you for coming in to the spin-off for When the Facts Change. Thank you. When the Facts Change was brought to you by the Spin-Off Podcast Network, together with KiwiBank. Visit kiwibank.co.nz to find out how KiwiBank are making Kiwi better off. Talo for lover. I'm Madeline Chapman, editor at The Spin-Off. If you have the means, consider supporting our high-quality journalism by becoming a Spinoff member. Sign up now at thespinoff.co.nz slash donate. The Spinoff Podcast Network.